morning, everybody. Uh, glad that you're here. We're in week, I think, five of a series that we're doing this to kick off the fall called Follow Me. If we haven't met, my name's Jose. We're going to pray. We'll do a quick recap of the first four weeks, and we'll dive, we'll dive in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you sent the Son. And Jesus, we thank you that you promised us the Holy Spirit. And so we're praying to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three beautiful persons. This is a mystery to us, how you all work together for our good. And now we want to be your people. We want to grow up, work together, be your church to show the world how good you are so that other people can experience life in you, Jesus. That's our prayer. So will you speak to us now, open our minds to see, open our ears to hear what you're doing and saying. And uh, we choose today to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, let's just recap real quick because some of you have just popped in. If you have, welcome. Uh, week one in this whole idea of following Jesus, we looked at what a disciple is. What's a disciple? Maybe you, you think that's a complex word. It's actually just an apprentice. A disciple is someone who comes under a leader to learn. And so if you call yourself a Christian, if you say, well, I'm a Christian, what we mean as we look at the Bible and what Jesus meant by that was that you would learn from him. Uh, second week, we looked at how we do that. We follow Jesus together. It's near impossible. There is the scenario where you use you and Jesus on an isolated island. Okay, that's not happening. But for the rest of us, how do you actually grow as a disciple, a learner? We do it together. God said, I'm going to build my church. Hell won't win. I'm going to win. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be the head of a people. A bunch of people who are different are going to come under me and learn and grow. And so church isn't an option if you choose to follow Jesus. This isn't like, well, it's me and Jesus, and if I have time, I go to church. You, you misunderstanding. The church belongs to and is connected to Jesus. So to throw away church is to say something negative about Jesus. And then in week three... We looked at the power of words. Words shape reality. Words are shaping your life. So God didn't just give us himself and the church. He gave us words. He gave us the Bible. And in the Bible, we grow in understanding who Jesus is, who we are, and who Jesus claims we're to be. So in order to become an apprentice, I need other people. I need the church. And I need to look at God's Words And then last week, Steve uh, Marshall did, did a great job of reminding us, that sounds complicated. Like, I got I to gotta do this. I got to go to church. and I, I got to learn the Bible. All this, I don't even know where to start. Well, you don't have to worry because God gave you himself. The Holy Spirit is God come to live with you and me so that we can know who he is. We can understand his words. We can relate to one another. And we can grow in understanding God's will for our life. Now, all of those things come under the umbrella of three words that I mentioned on week one. I'm going to mention them every week. In order to follow him, to follow the way of Jesus, three words, relationship, growth, and change. Say them with me. Relationship, growth, and change. Say it again. Relationship, growth, and change. A disciple is with Jesus. The goal is, is not just to attend meetings and buildings and read books. The goal is always to be with Jesus, to know his presence, to understand his ways, and to grow in that. There are things about Jesus, even though I've been following him, wow, for a long time now, almost 40 years. There are things about Jesus I don't know. There are dimensions about following him I haven't discovered Discipleship is always about being with him because when I'm with him, I'm, I'm created more like him. I want to be more like him. And the Holy Spirit enables me to actually make that happen. You, at the end of your life on this earth, if you say you're a Christian, should look, talk, act, live more like Jesus than when you first started. That's the goal of being a disciple. But that leads to growth. Being with Jesus means I'm going to learn from him, and then change is the byproduct. Change isn't a popular word, and some of us, were like, we're against it for whatever reason. But in order to dynamically follow Jesus, I'm going to continually change. One of my 
profs at Western Seminary, uh, Gary Brashear, is you'd be asked all the time because he's taught the Bible, you know, 40 years or so. And uh, people ask him, well, are, are you thinking differently from when you first started teaching 30, 40 years ago? I was like, oh, yeah, I change all the time. Like, what do you mean you, you change all the time? I'm always learning. I'm always growing. So here's a professor of Bible and theology who's admitting what so many of us don't want to admit. There's room for more. There's room for more growth. And so if you're not changing for the good, now <laughs> change in the other direction is not helpful, right? If you're not changing for the good, then I would say, man, let God use this series to stoke the fire in your life. So today what I want to do, that's just a little recap. Today what I want to do is I want to look at another dimension of growing in relationship to Jesus, and it's prayer. If you, if you have the book, if not, if you're new, we just, I wrote a little a short book as a follow-up to the Good News Today event that we had. And, and there's a chapter on every teaching we're giving. There's a chapter on it. We're not recapping it. We're not like reviewing it. But this is the foundation that this message is built on. So I would just encourage you, uh, when you go out, just pick it up. We're offering it for free. And next week when you come, read the next chapter, which next week is, um, what is next week about? Gosh, I should know this. I'm teaching on it. Sharing your story. Aha. Chapter 6, I got some work to do. <laughs> I'm behind. Uh, so, so just read chapter 6 and it will set your mind. It's like six pages. It will set your mind to be ready for next week. Well, in order to do this, turn in the Old Testament to 1 Samuel 1. We have so much to read that I'm not even going to put it on the screen. Uh, but look in your Bible or in your app. Always come ready. Have your app open. I use the Bible app. But if you have a printed Bible, fantastic. 1 Samuel 1. I want to read a long narrative, and then we're going to look at 1 Samuel 3, a long narrative, because God gives us narrative. When I say story, don't think fairy tale. The Bible is full of narrative, stories, real encounters with people. Here's why. God knows how we work. When I see something lived out in someone else's life, I can jump into that narrative. I see myself. And when we read this, I want you to think about who are you more like? There's a guy, Eli, a priest. There's going to be a lady, Hannah. Later on, there's going to be Samuel. As we read and you see people interplaying with God, I want you to put yourself in it. Who are you more like? And then we want to look at the nature of prayer because it's the most obvious but misunderstood and underappreciated disciplines of following the way of Jesus. So if you think you know how to pray, come with an open mind, all right? I'm going to start in 1 Samuel 1. I'm going to start in verse 6 because some of it is just intro. There's a couple. Uh, Hannah is married and she can't have kids. Start in verse 6. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, this is another woman who was married to the same guy, kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. And her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than, than ten sons? So Hannah is grieving. Now we know in here so far, the Lord had not given her the ability. God's at work even though she's disappointed, this is going to be a little disruptive. There are some things, some disappointments in your life right now. And you may be wondering, God, where are you? Why don't you? Why won't you? And what we're going to discover here is the Lord had closed her womb. God was doing something she was unaware of. And so she could have turned her back on God. Rather, in her in her situation, she turns to God. So verse 9, once uh, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord, almighty if you will only look on your servant's misery, and if you'll remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, I will give him 
to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Uh, and that was just uh, their way in their culture of saying he will be set apart as a priest, as a man of God. And so, God, if you'll hear me, what I want is a son that will be raised up to follow you. And I think if you're a mom or a dad, isn't that like, and you follow Jesus, isn't that what you want? You just, you want, if God will give you a child, that they would in turn follow Jesus and love him. And so, and so verse 12, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought she was drunk. So he said, to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. No, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I haven't been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my, heart, my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and, and grief. So this is interesting. She, as someone is observing her, prayer shows up in the way she looks. It's like she's mumbling as if she's drunk, she's just so in tune with God and pouring out out of grief and sorrow. And so we're learning something. Now, I'm not saying you have to pray like this, but I want us to get a grip on what prayer can look like. It could look like weeping. It could look like um, anguish. It could look like, God, I've got nowhere to go. It could look like desperation. So much so that Eli's confused by her posture, by the way she looks. And I don't know if you've ever been moved that way in prayer, where you're like, God, if I don't have a breakthrough, I don't know what I'm going to do. Is that what prayer looks like? That's what prayer can look like in some aspects of our life. Eli answered, verse 17, go in peace. And may God of Israel grant you what you've asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. Now, don't read into that like, oh, I forgot she was out there. No. The Lord remembered her heart her cry, her vow, her concern, her anguish. And God stepped in and does something. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. So she names him in response to God at work. He gets the name Samuel because she recognizes this boy is not just an accident or happenstance, or coincidence. God heard me, and, and she can't have children, and God gives her the cry of her heart. So she prays, she spends time with God, and God responds. I want us to just get a sense of what, what time with God can look like. She doesn't realize it. She goes home. She doesn't get a quote-unquote answer from God. She doesn't hear a voice, doesn't get a shining light, but her circumstances change. And then when her circumstances change, she recognizes this was God who heard my cry. Now I want us to jump to 1 Samuel 3. And I'm going to again read a long passage because I want us to see where, 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 you, where you see yourself. Do you see yourself more like Eli, who's a little skeptical about her approach? Do you see yourself like Hannah, who's desperate? Do you see yourself like Elkanah, the guy who's like, well, you know, why aren't you satisfied with me? Do you really need a child? Am I not enough for you? Uh, again, where, where do you find yourself in the story? First Samuel 3, now we're going to see Samuel who's growing up in the house of God. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There weren't many visions. And one night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak, he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. Eli's old now. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. And then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. 
So he went and he laid down. So God is speaking to Samuel, but Samuel doesn't realize it. And again, the Lord called, verse 6, Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you call me my son, Eli. I did not call. Go back and lie down. And, and now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. This is intriguing. Samuel is living in the place where God is worshipped, uh, but, but he's not yet aware of, of how hearing from God happens. And that could be where you are. That could be where I am. And there's nothing wrong with that. He just doesn't, he just doesn't know it yet. Verse 8, a third time the Lord called. Samuel, Samuel got up, went to Eli, said, here I am, you called me. Then, this is intriguing, Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli is going to help him out. Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and, and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood there calling as the other time. Samuel, Samuel, Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. And then he goes on and he he just gives them some more about what he's about to do. Again, I just, I want to read the narratives because sometimes we, we have a preconceived idea of what prayer can look like. And there's two scenarios here. These aren't the only. But in one case, it's Hannah pouring out her heart to God, and she just goes home. Her circumstances change, and God meets her. And another time, you have an interplay. God is communicating in a way that Samuel knows. He thinks it's the voice. This is really strange. The Lord is speaking, and the Lord sounds like the voice of Eli. Did you notice? He, he went, he, who did he go to? He goes to Eli, his, his leader. And he doesn't realize that this is not just the voice of a person. It's the voice of God himself speaking to him. So it's communic- God's communicating in a way that's clear to him. But, but Samuel doesn't get it. And then, then you have this, this interplay. Eli is going to help Samuel discern the voice of God. Now, what does that have to do with prayer and, and you and me? Um, I think we can grow in not just speaking to God, but listening, hearing, and then even discerning. I think we can grow as followers of Jesus in seeing the dots connect between when we go to God, honestly pouring out our heart, and then look at the circumstances of our life and see that God is speaking all the time. Hannah makes the connection that it was God who changed what was going on in the inside of her body. Not everyone makes that connection. And then even, to go another step further, Samuel is going to begin to learn, to discern what God is saying. Later on, God's going to say to Samuel, "Um, I'm raising up a king. Here's who he is. It's Saul. And then later on in his life, he's going to say, oh, I'm raising up another king. Here's who he is. It's David. And, and Samuel has this way of hearing from God and following God's commands that are a beautiful picture. Now for us, what is prayer? Let's, I'm going to quote myself from the book that I wrote on what prayer is. Just in case you don't take the time to read it, you're going to get it anyway. Prayer is simply an invitation to relationship. That's all it is. Prayer is an invite. Hannah has this relationship with God, and she meets with him, and he meets with her. And then, and then Eli and Samuel meet with God, and, and they, they, they interplay, they, they converse, they talk. We all know the power of conversations with family and friends. Prayer is less about mechanics. It's less about what I say and more about a shared experience. What God wants to do is share experiences with you regularly. God really wants to spend time listening and speaking with you. I want you to write something down if you're a a note taker. Write down the phrase, teach us to pray. Just write it down. Back in 2015, which feels like 35 years ago, but 2015 we did a five-week series here uh, based on the Lord's Prayer called Teach Us to Pray. And Rather than repeat ourselves or do that series again, I'm just going to say it's out there. Just go to our website or go to iTunes, and you can download five messages 
based on the Lord's Prayer on how Jesus taught us to pray. And so I would encourage you to do it. Three things, though, this morning I want to give you real quick. None of them are going to be new, but they may be more useful to you. So just if you have an ear here, be open to growing in prayer. Three things I want you to see. Most of it's based on two books I've read called Spiritual Lessons of the Christian Life by a guy named Donald Whitney. And another one, Hearing from God by Dallas Willard. Those are two books I would recommend. The first is this, and these are so simple. Number one, if you're a follower of Jesus and you want to follow him, prayer is expected. Prayer is a part of the rhythm of walking. And so to follow Jesus means that we talk to him. Think about any relationship that didn't communicate. Think about if you're married. Think about spending life with your spouse and never communicating. Some of you are doing that right now, and it's not going to help your scenario, right? Relationships require communication. And think about a friendship where you don't share ideas, you don't share experiences. And so Jesus said in Matthew 6, when you pray, and then he gives some qualifiers, don't be like the hypocrites. And then he goes on about what it means to be hypocritical when we pray. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father, Who's unseen? Implication, he's there, you just can't see him. And when you pray, don't keep babbling like pagans. They think they're going to be heard because they say a lot, because of their many words. This, then, is how you should pray. And then he gives us what we call the Lord's Prayer, five messages. What's the phrase you're supposed to write down? Teach us to pray. I'm trying to be an educator here. I'm watching you teachers. I hope you wrote it down. Okay. Prayer's expected. Now, that's not like, man, if I don't pray, Jesus doesn't love me. If you want to grow in relationship to him, if it's about relationship, growth, and change, prayer is the vehicle to keep communication alive. Second thing is going to be more telling. Prayer is learned. I don't think we think about it, but let me just ask you the question. Who taught you how to pray? When you first started following Jesus, did anyone sit you down Think about Samuel and Eli. Eli doesn't recognize that God's trying to get his attention. Finally, Eli says, here's what I want you to do. Now, you're not Eli and you're not Samuel and you're not called as a prophet to the nation called Israel, okay? So I realized that what God was doing is unique within that relationship. But because of Jesus, I want to suggest this. The relationship that Eli Eli had with God and the relationship that Samuel had with God is nothing compared to what you and I can experience. Their relationship isn't greater, it's lesser. Why? Jesus hadn't come yet and they hadn't don't have the fullness of the Holy Spirit that you and I enjoy right now. The Holy Spirit would come on them. The Holy Spirit would meet with them. But they didn't have a fullness of the Holy Spirit like you and I enjoy. When I read about Samuel and Eli, that should provoke me, draw me. What Jesus is saying for you and for me is even greater, greater than the prophets of old because Jesus came to bring all of us into the presence of God and you can enjoy it too. But prayer, hear me, it's learned. And so some of us, I'm going to make a a suggestion. I could be wrong. Some of us here are struggling in our prayer life because we never actually learned how to spend time with God. No one instructed us, and that's not a slam on the church or anyone else, but we've never enjoyed someone just saying, here's what I would suggest, here's what I would do, and so I'm going to hope to provoke some of that kind of thinking this morning. Colossians 4, 2-4 says, Devote yourselves to prayer, be watchful and thankful. Paul has to tell this Christian community, devote yourselves to it. He has to show them. And then he gives them some things to pray about. Pray for us. Don't just pray for yourself. Don't just pray for your needs. Don't just pray for your wants. Church, pray for us. Why? That God may open a door for our message, that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm changed, of which I'm in chains. Part of your prayer ought to be for other people that you're connected to that God would work in their life. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Paul takes the time to teach this church what it means to pray, not just for yourself, but for other people. And so I'm just curious, has anyone showed you the joys of struggling with God in prayer? It's not automatic. 
It's not necessarily automatic. So some of you lay off the guilt trip like, man, I don't, I don't pray because when I do it, nothing happens. Could it be there are some things that we can learn that will open our eyes and ears to hear what God is saying? I, I think the answer is yes. It's not always natural to communicate with someone that you don't see, <laughs> Right? Like, it's easy for me to communicate with you. I'm reading your body language even as I'm talking. I'm, I'm able to read you. You're able to read me. We see each other. But how do we discern what God is thinking, what God's attitude is when we don't physically see him? So I recognize this could be a challenge for us, but it's, it's, like, it's like running. Uh, most people are, have the ability to run, Right? Or most people have the ability to, to walk. Not everyone does, but most do. And most people can even speed walk, which is funny, if you think about it. If you've ever seen someone, you know, like the hips are moving and it just, it's very unnatural. It's a sport, I think. Uh, but <laughs> mo most people can. Now, in order to do it, all you have to do, it's so simple. Put one leg in front of the other. Anyone can run. Would you agree? Anyone can run. Or if, you have, if your legs are, are mobile and you can, most people, if, if you can walk, you can also run. But here's the funny thing. There are also things that you can learn to run better, more efficient, not hurt yourself. And so while anyone can run, there are some things that you can learn about stride and pace and posture and breathing and rest and wearing the right shoes and all those things. They're not necessary, but they'll make running more effective. And so in the same way, any one of us, all of us, can communicate with God. We can speak to him and we can listen. But I want to suggest, if you want to grow in your relationship and have growth in your soul and change, then this is an area where you and I ought to put some energy into. Anyone can run, but we can learn how to run better. Anyone can pray. We can learn how to pray with more depth and substance. Third thing, and we're almost done. Prayer is Prayer's conversation. It's, it's about talking, yeah. It's about listening. And this is, this is why we did this message after the message on the Holy Spirit, because this seems ethereal and impossible. You're telling me, Jose, I can hear from God? And I'm here to tell you, absolutely, you are probably hearing from God more often than you recognize, but it's more like Hannah. Uh, the, your circumstances change, and you say, wow, that's cool, forgetting that was God speaking and acting in response to your heart cry. So some of our listening to God is going to simply be connecting the dots and asking the Holy Spirit to connect the dots with what we're saying and what we're seeing and what God's doing and giving God the credit. I will name him Samuel because she recognized God had done this. And so some of our listening to God is going to be simply giving him the credit for what he's doing and what we were unaware of. It's a conversation, and it's a conversation we can grow in. Now, I want us to consider one way. So what I'm going to do is something to help us, hopefully. And if you're not into practices like, hey, do these things, and it will help you out, then that's totally cool. Just write it down, throw it out when you go home, okay? But I'm going to ask you to write down four things that you and I can do to connect the dots. What I want to suggest is if you want to hear from God more regularly, connect your Bible reading with your praying rather than making them two separate things. If I want to hear from God, there are, there are moments where God speaks in very profound ways he speaks through prophecy. God speaks through other Jesus followers who have words from the Holy Spirit for you and for me. And when I hear them, I'm like, wow, that was not Joe. That was not Sarah. That was Jesus using them to convey a message to me. But that's not the most common way that God's going to speak to us. God is already speaking all the time. He gave us Words, if you missed that message, hear that message about the Bible, the power of words to transform reality. And so if you're wanting to hear more from God, as you pour out your heart, we're pretty good at telling God what we want. I'm going to give you a little tip about prayer. we got to make prayer more than getting answers to our questions. What if, if you're a parent, you kind of get this. What if, what if every time your kids talk to you, the only thing they, they were asking is, what can I have, what can I have, what can I have, what can I have? 
What if, what if it was never about how are you doing? What if it was never about just spending time to get to know you? What if that relationship was all one way where it's I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, I need, and I need direction, and I need this, and I need that, and I need the other. What kind of relationship is that? We need to make prayer more than just what, what we would call petition. God, I, I need. Hannah brought her request to God. Nothing wrong with that. But I want to suggest that the day-to-day -day rhythm of meeting with God has to go beyond just asking for stuff. But getting to know God because he is. And he's worth it. And so one of the things I can do is I can connect my Bible. Whenever I am reading the Bible, I know God is speaking. Whenever I read the words, even if I don't understand them, I know God inspired, God breathed life. God put that on the page for my benefit. It's useful for teaching, grounding, correcting, training. It's never wasted. So what I want to ask us to do as an exercise is to grow in connecting Bible reading and making it a prayer. So write down these four words, read, reflect, respond, and rest. Write them down, and I'm going to explain them real quick. And I'm going to encourage you, if you're already hearing from God regularly and rhythmically, fantastic. If this isn't a tool to help, it's not necessary. Sometimes, though, when we're learning to run better, a coach has to come in and say, hey, your stride is off. Or your, your posture is bent. You need to stick your chest out so that you can get full breathing in. Those little tweaks can make a big difference. So I'm going to just suggest this. If you want to grow, try this as one. It's not the way. One way. Read the Bible. Reflect on what it says. Respond and rest. You may want to, just because of my marathon speaking nature, you know, I, I speak fast. Uh, you may want to take out your phone and take photos of these slides. If not, we'll send it out in a weekly to you. First is read. What do we do? Read a passage slowly. Read it again and again. Speed reading the Bible isn't helpful. Getting through it because it's on the chart for the day isn't going isn't to change anything. Find a short passage. Read it in multiple translations. If you have the U version of the Bible, you have all of them for free. Every English translation you ever want for free. Take that little section, a paragraph. Read it in multiple translations so it begins to illuminate your mind. Ooh, that's interesting. Look at that word. Look at that sentence. It may connect more with how you see it. And you don't have to read a lot. I would say spend time with God with three sentences from the Bible and read it again and again and again and again. Why? The goal is not to get through. The goal is if God is always speaking, I want to allow this to begin to open my mind as to what to pray. Second, I want to reflect. Write this down. What words or lines stick out more than others. When you read, what's going to happen? You read a paragraph, you read two paragraphs, a word is going to pop out as more, well, maybe you don't understand it. Ooh, I could do some, I could do a little research. Maybe it sticks. I was like, wow, that's profound. And I want you to ask these questions. What do we see about God in what I'm reading? Get the focus off of what I need. God knows your needs before you ask him. What do, I, what do I see about God? What do I see about myself? When we were reading about Hannah and Eli, and we were reading about Eli and Samuel, did you see yourself in there? What do I see about myself? What do I see about my situation? Have you ever felt when you were reading the thing about Hannah or hearing it? Man, I know what she's going through. What does that say about your situation? And what I want to do is I want to read the Bible to see what it's saying, and then find one thing that I'm going to think about and move to response. The third thing is we respond. When I think about what it's saying and what sticks out to me about God, about myself, about my circumstances, I want to respond. I want to turn what I'm reading into prayer. Remember, prayer is just an invitation to time with God. It's conversation. So I'm hearing what he's already said. I'm seeing something about him, and then I'm turning it to response, I'm going to ask God, God, what does this connect? How does this connect with my life today? God, what do I need to know about you? God, what do I need to be? God, what do I need to do? 
This may be, um, this may be academic at first. It may be simply writing this out and then opening your Bible and literally filling in your own blank. But I'm going to say do the work because if it gets you to a point where you see something about God you didn't see, it was worth the exercise. My friend, that in its essence is prayer because prayer is communication. And when I begin to see God for who he is, when I begin to see myself for who God says I am, when I begin to see my circumstances in light of God, I'm spending time with him. When I think of conversation, I think of it in human perspective where we're going back and forth. Well, I don't see God. And when you spend time in the Bible and it's just you, you need to know this, it's not just you. The Holy Spirit is there with you trying to help you see what God is already saying in your life. And, and I, wanna, I, I, I wanna end that response time with what should we ask? I'm gonna ask God, God, in light of what I see about you or my circumstance or what I think you're telling me to do, God, what do you want me to ask for? Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, great and mighty is your name. Give me everything I want. No. What is it? What is it? Our Father in heaven, great is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will, your action be done here as it already is. Jesus taught us to pray. God, get me in alignment with you. And the things that are burdening you help me to be burdened by what burdens you. It may seem academic, but I'd say write it down. And then finally, rest. And this seems ethereal, but I want you to take time at the end of it. What about God makes you want to worship him? As you've read, as you've thought, what is it about God that just strikes you? I want you to, especially if you're a phone frantic person like I am, don't be tempted to move on, but I want you to sit for a couple of minutes and just think about God. Think about him. You, quiet, Bible, your little journal open, and just think. And don't feel like you have to make something happen. Wait on him. Look at what Eli says to Samuel. Go lie down. And when God nudges you, simply say, here I am, Lord. Your servant is listening. Take time for him. And then if something strikes you and it comes to mind, forget about getting it wrong. Who cares about getting it wrong? You write down what you think God may be stirring you to write down. You say, what is God stirring you to write down? Whatever comes into your brain. You just write it down. And then if it seems to become a prayer that is something that is lifted back to God, you've got something to start your next conversation with God. Because if this becomes part of my daily rhythm, what you can do on Tuesday is start with what God was stirring on Monday and think about what God had st said on Monday. And then Tuesday, start your prayer with what God was saying on Monday. And then Tuesday's crickets. And I gotta, I gotta say this. You spend time with God, some moments will be dramatic and amazing. And some moments will be like, wow, I did it. And I quote unquote got nothing. But don't you forget, when Hannah pours out her heart towards God, it wasn't till she got home. And in the rather regular rhythm of life, she was with her husband, and God in his grace caused her to be pregnant. And it wasn't until nine months later that she saw the fulfillment of what God had been stirring months ago. So let's get in the daily rhythm of reading and reflecting and responding and then resting. If I didn't hear anything profound or nothing wow happened, I don't give up on God. I'm like, God, thank you for this moment of peace with you. I'll see you later. I'll see you at lunch. I'll see you in the car and move on. You say, Jose, I don't know if I can do that. Can I just encourage you, start somewhere. What we're going to do is, we won't do it for time here, but I'm going to record a little 15-minute example of this. And if you sign up for our, our e-weekly, you'll just get a little bit of a video, a short video of working this out in ordinary, everyday life. I want us to begin to work out and practice rhythms that can get us thinking about God. And when we're thinking about God and still, I, I can guarantee you, God will communicate to you in a way that makes sense to you. And you won't have to wonder if it's him 
over time, like Samuel learned as a child, you'll begin to sense in your own soul, that wasn't just me, that was God speaking. Well, read, reflect, respond, and, and rest. We're not going to take the time to do that together. I hope that's helpful. If not, come next week and maybe there'll be some practice, some tip, some thing that you can do to grow as a follower of Jesus. All right, put your Bible to the side. Why don't you stand to your feet, put your journal to the side, and let's, um, let's invite God, the Holy Spirit, as we sing songs to him to encounter us where we're at. And don't forget, God just doesn't want to speak to us when someone's preaching from a stage. God wants to speak to us in all sorts of moments. So don't be surprised. Just like I'm saying, take time, be alone, open your Bible, open a journal, work through this out. God in his goodness, as we're singing one of these songs, he may stir a line in one of the songs that sticks out to you. If he does, before you go, just write it down. Just if a lyric sticks out to you or a thought about God sticks out to you. And then the next time you go to be with God, start with that. God, thank you for this truth about yourself. Thank you for reminding me about how faithful you are. Thank you for reminding me that you love me. And make that the beginning point of your continued conversation with God. Lord, we come to you wanting to hear you more, wanting to know your voice, wanting to discern your ways. And we confess that this is for many of us a challenge and a disappointment. But Lord, we want to move away from just asking for stuff and we want to know you better. So Holy Spirit of God, even as we offer up these lyrics that were crafted by someone else who follows you, thinking and reflecting about who you are, as we now vocalize them, not just from our lips and our lungs, but from our soul, from our deepest part. Lord, whatever we need, we entrust it to you. And God, whatever we, we need to know about you, even as we sing these songs, expand our mind, help us to see you for who, we are, for who you are so that we can follow you. In Jesus' name we pray.